I'm Kayla. And I'm Haley. And we majored in English for this. For this? Alrighty, folks. Welcome to The Deep. That's our episode. Thank you. I forgot to open up the notes. Love that for me. You, you like, always prepare people for your ASMR crack, so I thought I would just do mine really sporadically. I already opened this. This is take two of, of this podcast episode. You know. Things happen. You live, you learn. It happens. We're still having issues with these microphones. But guess what, everyone? Right now, as you listen to this episode, we are also recording it through video. What? Oh, yeah, I forgot that it will also be audio. I was thinking it's just video now, but it's not. No, we're also we're recording. We're in a set. We're here. Also, my clicks are so loud now. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have a set in my basement. It's a little echoey right now. We're still working on working all the kinks out. Yep. Um, but this week we read The Deep by River Solomon. William Hudson, Jonathan Snipes, and David Diggs. <laughs> um, this book came out in 2019. And basic, okay, so what you should know about this book coming into it, that's the book, um, is that it's like uh, the third iteration of the game of telephone. It started off as like all the musical work of a band called Drexamia. Drexia. Drexia. I put an M in there, that should have been not been there. And then uh, Clipping did some music based off of it. And then now the book. Is Clipping, David, Jonathan Snipes, and William Hudson, is that who Clipping is? I don't know. I did not look that up. Okay. I can look that up right now. My little cellular device. I feel like that would make sense because the there's clipping. only, there's two, two musical. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's the V Diggs. Uh, the group consists of rapper V Diggs and producers William Hudson, Jonathan Snipes. So that's how that happened. Daveed Diggs. Okay. Anyways, uh, moving on. Nothing happened there. So this book came out November 5th, 2019. That's two years ago. By Saga Press. Just looked on the book. Cool. First read this one. Did you have any nostalgia you want to talk about? No, not really. This was like a very new experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But. All right. So let's get into this bad boy. What happened here? We have two epigraphs. We will love an epigraph. So, to the ornery and ill-tempered RS. We're assuming that's River Solomon, though it could be R.L. Stein. You know what? We can go with this fantasy in your head that it's R.L. Stein, the children's horror movie, <laughs> horror book. <laughs> <laughs> who knows who knows who knows okay and then from the clipping or just clipping this book and the song for which it's named would not exist without the work of gerald donald and james stinson see doesn't it sound like gerald donald and james stinson like there are three brothers <laughs> no. but no it's gerald donald that's his name gerald donald and james stinson correct so Book opens on Yetu being admonished by Ama Am I can't pronounce any words ever. So this is these are not microaggressions. I'm so sorry. Amaba? Amaba? Amaba. Amaba. That makes more sense. Uh, her mother for swimming into shark infested waters. Yetu is drawn there by the memories of the ancestors. She also does like this blocking off thing with her emotions. I interpret it as that. Haley interpreted it differently. It's like how she perceives information. Mm -hmm. Like it's how in the deep, that's how they see, that's how they hear. Cause there's no light and mm -hmm. there's nothing for, it's like electricity and she can like feel it. It's like very amplified how she mm -hmm. feels it, which is why she's the historian also. So. Yeah. I took it as like disassociation. I think it's that too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little bit of that. Too. Okay. So I got some quotes. Most of the time, Yatu kept her senses dulled. As a child, she learned to shut out what she could of the world, lest to overcome her into fits. But now she had to open herself back up to make her body a wound again so Amaba's words would ring against her skin more clearly. 
yet you closed your eyes and honed in on the vibrations of the deep purposely, fully resensitizing her scaled skin to the onslaught of the circus that is the sea. It was a matter of reconnecting her brain to her body and lowering the shield she put in place in her mind to protect herself. As she focused, the world came in. The water grew colder, the pressure more intense, the salt denser. She could parse each granule, individual crystals, the flaky white minerals scraped against her. Even though Yetu always kept herself tense against the ocean's intrusions, they found their way in. But with her freshly, with her senses freshly unrained, the rush of feeling was dizzying. There was nothing like the faraway throbbing she'd grown used to when she threw all of her energy into repelling the world outside. The push and pull of nearby currents upended her. The flutter of a school of fangfish reverberated deep in her chest. How did the other Wajin room manage this all the time? Yep. So, so that's Yetu. So Yetu is sick. Her body is wasting away. She's struggling to, to differentiate past from the present. Ababa wants her to eat and basically like force feeds her while coddle like full on like like holding her like mother daughter bonding moment while Yetu does not want to be there. No. So and Yetu is like thirty. Like she's yeah, not she, a she's a child. She's thirty four. So we find out exactly why Yetu is suffering. Given her sensitivity, no one should have been surprised that the rememberings affected Yetu more deeply than the previous historians. But then everything surprised Wajinru. Their memories faded after weeks or months, if not through Wajinru biological predisposition for forgetfulness, then through sheer force of will. Those cursed with more intact long-term regulation learned how to forget, how to throw themselves into the moment. Only the historian was allowed to remember. Very the giver. I forget what the who the giver is. The giver is like allowed to like see color, right? Yeah, yeah the the giver gets to learn everything and experience emotion, and because it's the get like the givers. We'll, we'll talk about the giver later. <laughs> it's very giving the giver. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. Right. So Yetu is also in another predicament. If she succumbs to the memories and dies too far away from her people, the memories would be would not be able to be harvested mm -hmm. and passed to the next historian who has not yet been chosen. That's poor planning on the part. That um, is poor planning. Like I feel like you should have three historians ready to go just in case. Yeah. Or else you'll lose just, you know, the history of your entire people. Yeah. So Yetu does not like being a historian and thinks she should not have been chosen. We find out from Amaba that Yetu is actually three months late to the yearly remembrance uh, where she gives the rest of her people a taste of the memories of their ancestors and why they live the way they do. Mm -hmm. um, and so she gets whisked back to their people. I got a quote. Uh, the remembrance was no longer sung for that mortal mercy, mortal mercy. Yetu gave thanks. She understood why all the historians before Basha performed the remembrance to Melody, that impulse to salvage a speck of beauty from tragedy with a dirge. But Yetu wanted people to remember how she remembered, with screams. She had no wish to transform trauma to performance, to parade what she'd come to think as, of her own tragedies for entertainment. That's very interesting. Yeah. Like, I, I understand, like, I get, like, what, what she's symbolizing here is where previous historians wanted it to be entertaining and like consumable yeah while yet to and ba basha before her as well mm -hmm. even were like no you need to know right um they have their reasons for this in different ways we'll get to that <sighs> so we find out they there are six thousand wajinru which we love that she meets with ninyo who is the overseer of the historian and he's kind of disappointed in her but also like really be like hmm I see you're dying but I'm yeah, also like gonna like, use you I feel like he kind of understands because like like yeah too she like feels the remembering so much deeper because of just like how she was born so I think that they like that Ninyo like understands why mm. she maybe gets taken away. No, you're not doing that. 
Kayla's trying to eat while recording and I will not allow it. I eat a single noodle. Okay. So Nino and his children gift her a Oh, well, I didn't finish this. So Amaba is actually is very gentle yet too. And yet too is just like, I hate this, but also I wish you had done this when I was a child and needed this. Right. Cause like Yetu can remember everything because she's the historian. So like mm -hmm. she not only remembers the past, but also her own life, obviously. Mm -hmm. And all of the other Wajinru forget after like mm -hmm. it's more a couple months. It's more impressions than actual memories. Right. It's like you know like the people you live with because you're with them every day. Like you yeah. don't forget them. So like Amaba doesn't remember how shitty she used to be. Yeah, to Amaba's just like, oh yeah, we fought all the time, and Yetu's just like, you said horrible things. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, Yetu is now thirty-four years old, and like this is like a tumultuous relationship between them. Yeah. Okay, so Ninyo and his children gift her a dead vampire squid, and inside it is something. Mm -hmm. Something. Okay, I gotta call one of. Ajeji's siblings, yet to guess Kata by the precise jagged movements, opened up the slit they cut into the flesh and removed a small flat object which she handed to yet to. What is it? she asked. We don't know, but we know how much you like to have old things you can actually hold. It was found here near the sacred waters, lodged, lodged inside the skull of a two-legged circus dweller, which itself was inside the belly on Yetiket. Kata said. Anyetiket? she asked. She hadn't thought of that shark in some time. Anyetiket had only died last year, but had lurked in these waters since the first Wanjinru 600 years ago. Her age and infamy had earned her a name, which was not an honor bestowed on most sea creatures. And then she guessed that the two legs and the two-legged skull inside Anyetiket had been what had made her so ill all these years there was a chance that it was the head of one of the first mothers the drowned cast off surface dwellers who gave birth to the early wajin room hmm. Hmm. so she digs in her memories for what this object could be and then the remembering takes over her in the sacred waters there was never color because there was never light that was how yetsu knew that the remembering had overcome her because there was blurred color, light from above the ocean surface peeked through, painting the water a dark grayish blue. It was bright enough to reveal a dead woman floating in front of her, with brown skin and two legs. There it was, something pressed into her short, coarse hair. The object is a hair comb. So, uh, what I want to know, and I still do not know after finishing the book, why was it lodged in a skull like if it was just like a comb it would have fallen I, I, out with the hair no 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 so hair actually stays longer on skulls that's why sometimes when they find skulls there's still scalp on it so if um the shark had eaten a uh human skull and it still had hair and coarse thick hair we're assuming here it would stay implanted in just in the shark's stomach, especially if it was made from a non-organic material. I don't love that. Okay, well, I got another quote. Yet to stare, so she's remembering. Yet to stare at the face of the woman in her remembering. Not, not yet bloated by death and sea, preserved by the iciness of the deep. She was heart stilling and strange, her magnetic, her beauty magnetic. Yetu couldn't look away, not even when she felt someone shaking her. Yetu. Yetu! In the remembering, Yetu was not herself. She was possessed by an ancestor living their story. Not Yetu reached out for the comb and the sunken woman's hair and noticed the smallness of her own fins. The woman between the more stable cartilage finger lungs not yet developed. She was a young child, old enough to be eaten, fish, shrimp, and so on, pre-mashed by someone bigger but still young enough to need mostly whale milk to survive. Little hands grabbed the comb then. Uh, not yet too was jamming it into her mouth to stimulate and soothe her aching gums. During such rememberings, yet too's loneliness abated, overcome with the sanctity of being the vessel for another life. And in a moment like this, a child's life, a child who'd grown into an adult and then an elder so many lifetimes ago. And yet, here they were together, one. Yet too, please! It ached to leave the foremother, the peacefulness of being the child, the comb. But she had her own comb now. Nino had chosen his gift for her wisely. Aww. 
Mm -hmm. I love that. I really the gift part, not like the, all the horrible. Yeah, I really like how River Solomon like wrapped all these like tenuous feelings to do with like trauma together of like how you reflect on traumatic experiences but with enough distance to where you can be even fond of those moments right okay so yetsu comes back to herself and then it's time for the ceremony um so they built this big giant mud dome called yeah. the mud dome <laughs> called the woo <laughs> um it takes three days to build and the rest of the people fast you know mm -hmm. they gotta be empty for those memories but yet to feast constantly rebuild her strength because she's been gone for like a year not eaten and like most of the time lost in memories and not hunting or yeah. eating she's withered yeah so she won't succumb to the memories during the ceremony a mama asks what this object was and yet to doesn't want to answer her first and then they argue they have a quote they have a quote he quote Someone normal wouldn't be able to tell you that the object is a comb. Someone normal wouldn't be able to tell you that a comb was a tool that the Wajin Room foremothers used in their hair, said Yetu. Someone normal would never know these things. Someone normal couldn't fill your hole. You are someone normal and you don't know anything. That's so harsh, but also imagine the, being the only person that has like long-term memories that sh that would be so annoying yep, yep and for her mom to complain when she knows that yetu deals with this all the time like it is kind of shitty mm -hmm. like i kind of agree but also it's a little harsh okay so mama moves past the argument easily the nino comes back it's only been two days but the womb is ready and it's time for the ceremony how are you feeling nino asked yetu nodded her head I will do what is asked of me. You are a blessing, said Nino. I am what is required, she said. Okay, so I really don't want to paraphrase this next chunk. Okay. Instead, I want to re read straight from the book. Also, I did not copy all my notes, so I am reading off the phony phone. I'm not just texting. I'm reading off the phony phone. <laughs> you're just texting. Like, you're just, you can't even be bothered to be here. Okay. So, so the ceremony time, they're in there doing the thing. Okay. Our mothers were pregnant two legs thrown overboard while crossing the ocean on slave ships. We were born breathing water as we did in the womb. We built our home on the seafloor, unaware of the two-legged surface dwellers, Yetu said. In general, she didn't tell the remembrance. She made her people experience it as it happened in the minds of various Wajinru who lived it. At the start, however, she preferred to give them some guidance. It made the transition of memories much more efficient when they had context. Context Yetu had never had. She discovered the history on her own through out-of-order scraps and pieces, slivers slicing through her. Yetu twisted and tense as pain overwhelmed her. That was something she would be over by now, after all this time, the physicality of it. But she felt her whole body go rigid and then snap. Her body was full of other bodies. Every Wajinru who had ever lived possessed her in this moment. They gnashed, they clawed, desperate to speak. Yet to channel their memories, sore and shaking as she brought them to the surface. The shock of it nearly knocked her unconscious. She had once imagined channeling as a sweet, beautiful flow of energy that passed gently running through her. It was more like slitting and opening herself so they could get out. Oh, was this pain real? It didn't even belong to her. Was there anything about her that wasn't a performance for others' gratification? As Yetsu's body moved with the pain, her subjects moved too. They didn't quite copy her. Never imply they would see anything but the black of the deep of the sea. They felt her and knew what to do. For once, all were in unison. Intense. There's so much to unpack that I just don't even <laughs> know what to say. Yeah, I feel the book I feel like does a really good job of like unpacking these traumatic moments. Right. And like when I I was supposed to do the notes and I didn't. I was trying to think of like how it's like you kind of just do have to like go through it and then we can try to unpack it at the end, I guess. Yeah. All right. So she makes them remember the ancestors drowning. And then one member forgets herself and Yetu forces them to remember, which is like a foreshadowing that comes. 
And so she fills everyone with all the memories, purging herself. But she also wants to rush it because it's so overwhelming. So she's like this duality of like, I don't want to experience this right now, but you need to experience it. It's like right. when you're so full of pain and anger of where you want to force the people around you to feel that pain and anger. Right. Yeah. Okay, so next, after the drowning is when the sharks feasted on the bodies of the four mothers. And then so... Here we go. I believe this is the next little quote you have. Yeah, this is the next quote I have. Um, so she's like showing them the uh, the the dead bodies of mm -hmm. enslaved women um, mm -hmm. being feasted on by humans, and then no, by sharks. By sharks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cannibals. And so this is like their response. So we've been basically seeing it for the first time right. again and again and again. Every single year. The split fins are our kin, someone said. Another said, they are nearly our twins. The differences were great too, but anyone looking at the two creatures could see they were of the same heritage. I'd never seen anything in the deep that looked so much like us, said another. The moment the Wajinru understood how related they were to the two legs, the remembering changed, just how I had for yet to two days ago. Their lives recently extinguished, some sparks still remain, brain starved for oxygen, but pressing on. The Wajinru felt the deadness like it was their own. Like yet too, they couldn't take it. It was too strange to carry both truths at once. The aliveness of their own bodies and the deadness of the two legs' corpses. The conflict split their minds in half, threatening their own bodies. That was why Yetu had squeezed a dragonfish to death, pried open its dead jaw, pressed its teeth into her scales until she stained the water red, then swung to where the sharks hunt easy prey, to join the realities, to make sense of it all. Sometimes the rememberings took precedent over everything else, even over the survival of the present. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot right there. Just, I really like, once again, like, self-harm. Uh, trigger warning as well um, is it uh is just like we forgot to do the trigger warning we did so many trigger warnings uh, i'm not trigger warning this book so i'm i'm done now what what okay anyways um yeah it, it was just very inter like not interesting like a, just very realistic of i really love how river solomon talks about trauma and your internal responses yeah. to trauma it's your, like so like not i don't know the word like embodied like you mm -hmm. it's how you're reading it how it actually feels yeah okay so after that she gets so she, the, this is her getting through her own like work throughs of what she's pieced together right then she must remember basha's memories right and then the historian before him and him and right so it's it's not even just like saying this is the my version of the histories and everyone I've learned. Right. This is Basha's before Basha, all the way up to Zito. 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 Zeto. Zeto. Zetu. Zoti. Zoti. <laughs> we would have got there. Okay. Um, and then Yetu is empty. Empty for now until her people force the memories back into her for safekeeping until the next remembrance, where they will do this all again. Yatu doesn't want that. She's tired of the pain of the memories, and she knows she will die this year if she's forced to take them on again. And so, Yatu leaves her people and the memories. And now we move to the perspective of the Zoti, who, uh, it's kind of confusing because this is told through a plural point of view. Right, it's like, it's the memory of one person, but because that memory is now everyone's, Mm -hmm. they use we instead of yeah i so uh zoti is with a pod at first like with their a bunch of other little zotis yeah. and they're the fish children of the four mothers yes can i bring forth my quotey quote i don't know what they were calling themselves at this point i don't know you fish <laughs> children is probably accurate okay so, okay, here we go. No, this is not the right quote. Hold on. <laughs> I love when this doesn't work. Okay. 
So they're just swimming along. And then our pod never preferred to feast on carcasses, didn't like the rot, but sometimes it was necessary. Right now for us, newly orphaned as we were, it was a nest it was necessary. We swam toward we swim toward the floating creature, but it's not dead. It is not even sleepy. It turns towards us first with a look of shock, then the look of fear. It is smaller than it should be, emaciated, and it cannot swim well. Lashes on its back, it is a surface dweller of some kind, a land animal. Despite our hungry belly, we cannot eat this creature, whose face is so captivating, drawing us in. Something familiar and warm circles through us, a memory written in our blood. Though it looks like a stranger, we, a small and scaled squirming thing, have come from the belly of a being like this. So, the Zoti saves this woman. Mm -hmm. Um, and brings her up to land and like rescues her, gives her a bunch of food, and then the woman teaches her. We begin to understand the things this strange creature says. And the more we do, the more we begin to think of her of it as her water means where we live. Land is where she lives. Sky is what is above. Sand, stone, trees, fire, hungry, hot, cold, sweat, sad. She talks and talks and we listen. Captivated by the noises, she is nothing like our pod, friendly and warm, but she gives to us in her own way. She gives us time. She gives us objects to explore. She gives us words. Every day we recognize more of them. Bark, spice, cut, bruise, scale, thin, us, tomorrow, yesterday, light, dark. As we grow, we learn until we can make sense of almost every noise that comes from the two legs mouth. The fascinating world of the surface dwellers opens up to us. Their technologies and creatures, their ways of seeing. You're perplexing, she says to us. And though we don't know what perplexing is at first, we begin to use, begin to, as she uses it, to describe other things. Mysterious tracks in the sands, a washed up object she can't identify. Perplexing means a problem she hasn't solved. She is always trying to understand the world. She is like us hungry for more so zoti wants this woman to be uh their god but the woman's like i'm just a human thank you and this woman is named wash and names the zoti uh, zoti ala zoti a aleu aleu yeah zoti um, aleu zoti aleu which means strange fish and um i'm not sure which african language this that is, is. Um, wash leaves and zoti aleu is alone and I have a quote. We dive down to the deep where the second mother once dragged us. This pressure is immense and it squeezes us. We plunge the cold to the darkness. The deep will be our sibling, our parent, our relief from endless solitude. Down here, we are wrapped up. Down here, we can pretend the dark is the black embrace of another. Down here, we eventually find more of us. A whale, one of the biggest we've ever seen, descends like a sunken ship. We tremble as it hums its song wash so so this whale comes by opens its little mouth and guess what guys in its little mouth it's big little mouth really <laughs> it is a bunch of little zodi mm -hmm. um so the Elihu takes these baby zodis raises them and names them and then they find even more first we find two twins not quite fresh out of the womb but nearly we look through the water trying to find where they have come from they have drifted too far we are nine in total now, then we are 16, then we are 17, then 30. It was only a few years later that we find some closer to my age, a pot of four. We cannot speak to one another, but their joy is plain. We are 60 now, then 70, and yet we are one. For those not from my fold, it is difficult to get along at first. They are without language almost completely with, but 50 or fewer concepts they learn. So. Uh, eventually, the Zodi grow to 300, but our original Zoti Aleu still misses Waj and wants to know where, where the Zoti come from. And uh, they travel through the ocean. And then Zoti Aleu finds the dead body of a pregnant woman, um, freshly dropped, yeah. um, and coaxes the child to come out. Um, there's a round button on its bo bo belly that looks promising that we fill with our front fins. We wonder if we have to nudge it open. We press and press, but it does not yield. Then the surface dweller's legs begin to splay apart and we come under it. We see it, the head, 
Our eyes wide and struck. It is not a two legs head. There are fins at the center of its back, one at its sides and one at its front, hairless and darker than any land creature. It is a Zotileu. It is Zotileu. Well, I guess at least the baby was saved. Right. I. Horrific, terrifying, traumatic. Okay. Zotileu is now coming to the end of her life. Um, and I have a quote from here. In the last moments of our life, we try not to linger upon the horrors of which there were many. We do not think about the secret of our origin and how easy it is to become. It became to find Zotileu. Once we learned it, we discover which ships to follow. We memorize their routes. We learned their accents, their languages, and heard them through the water like an alarm. We followed ships for none went overboard. This brought its own grief. We knew the lives of those on the ship would not be good ones. So that's really like that alone is just talking about how is death better than torture is really what it comes down to. Is it better to die or better to live in pain and agony? Which really is a very philosophical question, which I'm not asking you to answer in this moment. In time. Okay, thank you. Because I'm not going to. <laughs> not in this headspace. No. Okay, so then, then Zotileu basically removes the memory centers in everyone's minds. I, is it like that? Or she just encourages people to not think about it? No. Let me read it. I did not grab. I'm, I will read this particularly to you. Okay, because... I didn't know if it was like a thing she did or if it was like a way that they evolved to just not remember. We never wanted our people, our kindred, to suffer the loneliness we have known. Over the years, when others came to us desperate to talk about it, we encouraged them to forget. Focus on what we have together, here, now. Not all could manage it. They required extra help to let go of those terrible memories. We reached into their minds and searched, taking away the hurtful moments where we found them. So it, it so that's why um, uh, Yetu points out that some of them have longer memories, right? Even if they're not historians, and but they can make themselves forget, while others could not. So you can see how the genetics play a role into that. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, so um, um, yeah, so Zeti Aleu does that. Z Zodi Aleu does that. Um, so the trauma of their past will not haunt them all as it does now, and as it will do more when Zoti Aleu dies. The pup who Zotileu helped birth is now grown. Is, his name is Aj. Um, he's small. Um, Zotileu passes all the memories onto him. We close our eyes in Aj's arms, listening to the water, to the noise of the city, to our kindred all around us. There are so many of us now. We could hardly be called strange fish anymore. We have made a place in this sea. Of the fluttering, building, loving, hunting, embracing, mating, we hear it all, our presence unmistakable. A whole chorus of the deep, Wajinru, we are not Zotileu. We are more vast, more beautiful than that name implies. We are a song and we are together. We remember. So is that when they like, do they still like bring more people? Do they still keep finding new? Yeah. Wajinru or is that like the so they, end of their mm, growing? No, because because they they start mating and making more. Yeah. I think they have to find more. It says later on that uh, the whales bring them to them when they find them. Okay, because it's kind of just like an just a thing. Yeah, uh, Wajinru. Um, they are they they started when the slave trade happened six hundred right. years ago. Slave trade has only been ended for about. 150 years so at that but at the end of Zotileu's life it's still going on right and then so as I, long as the that happened mm -hmm. there was gonna be more Wajinru being yeah because uh Yetu's only 34 so she would have been born in the late 80s and Basha's life is during is is Po is like from like World War Two, basically, because the bombings. So I don't know. Is that what that means though? Because the Wajinru can, because like Ninyo is one hundred and fifty, so yeah. they like live but, longer. But Basha um was alive up up until the nineties, right? Because he was alive when he yeah, was but he alive. he was alive during when we had bombs dropping the oceans, right? But. 
but during Bosch's life time they weren't finding new people it was a historian before him okay and then Aj was obviously the first historian okay or technically the second historian what would you say I think Zoti was probably the first historian yeah. I feel like she was the one that like gathered yeah. the memories of the people that were alive yeah okay now we go back to Yetu Yetu is full blast running away um is trying to hide so she goes towards the surface and then she floats and is in pain and suffering. Her body is still emaciated. Um, she cannot do anything. And so it just days and days of that. And there's a storm. And then she wakes on the shore with humans. Um, there's four of them. She accidentally beaches herself. Yeah, she gets caught in a tide pool. Um, she scares them so they leave her alone. Very terrifying, this scene. <laughs> where she's just like, I opened my mouth so wide my nose disappeared. <laughs> Um, so she scares them till they leave them alone, but she's afraid and stuck in a tide pool. Yetsu forces herself to accept that her people can deal with their memory, even though she knows they probably actually can't. Right. <laughs> and she wakes up the next day to find that one of the humans left her food. Um, and, it, uh, after a few days, she sees who is bringing her the food. Uh, it's a person named Suka, and they are shocked to find out she can talk. Uh, they're shocked, and then they say that- it's Which, a, how she can speak English, we don't know. I think, I think it's one of those, they're like- even, They're not actually speaking English. Oh, yeah, English. sorry. They're speaking- It's written in English, but- Right, it's not, obviously. It's not English. But, like, is it just because it was, like, that language was passed they, down in the memories? They, they learned the language from- From following Bosch. the boats. No, because it said- it said- but Zoti, oh, yeah, they followed the boats, learned Zoti the different learned languages. English. Zoti probably also knows French. Zoti learned the languages of the enslaved people who were coming so they could track them and follow them. Right, okay. So, like, but still, it's like the community, it's the communal memories. It's the, mem it's the okay. memories. Yeah. Gotcha. That's what the Even though all of them are gone, she still has essences of them ingrained in her. Right, it's like that, like, mm -hmm. body knowledge. Yeah. So uh, Suka says that it's actually Ori. Uri? Uri? Ori. It is Ori? Okay. It's spelled O O R I, so that's why I wanted to clarify. So Ori is a woman who's helping gather the food for Yetu. Yetu finally meets Ori after a few days. And slowly, Yetu and Ori build a friendship between them. Um, and though Yetu is enjoying her freedom, she constantly worries about her people and what she left them to. Her and Ori talk, and we found out Ori is actually the last of her own people. Mm -hmm. Basically, her tribe has di like disappeared. She's literally right. the last of her people, right. of her ethnic group, basically. Yeah. And I have quotes. Um, so this is after they've been like buddies for a while. Um, what was that? Was that your watchy? It was. Um, <laughs> my watch says connect with yourself as your day comes to an end love that okay so they're talking and um they're like yetu's trying to like like what something here anyways let me read the quote <sighs> or he's talking about like how the past sucks right but then yetu's like oh you think your past sucks <laughs> If the past is full of bad things, and the people is defined by the terror done to them, it's good for it to go, don't you think, said Yetu? I was a historian. It made her feel so good to say that was no longer. She blinked her eyes shut and tried to cast out thoughts of the watching room locked in the remembrance. It was a very holy thing for my kind. It, it meant I held onto all the memories so no one else had to. Generations and generations of them. 600 years of pain. Were you like a storyteller then, said Ori. Yetu shook her head. All the memories of those who've come before, they lived inside me, real as flesh. I remember them like they were my own. I walked inside them. Ori nodded, curious and intrigued. Touched by spirits, she said sagely. By electricity, Yetu countered, and it hurts. I gave up the memories so I could be free, so she could live. Ori looked at the sea unblinking. I would take any amount of pain in the world if it meant I could know all the memories of the Ashuvin. I barely know any stories from my parents' generation. I can't remember our language. How could you leave behind something like that? Doesn't it hurt to not know who you are? 
I know who I am now. All I knew before was who they were, who they wanted me to be, said Yetu. And it was killing me. It did kill me. I wasn't Yetu. I was just a shell for their whims. Ori shook her head and stood up from the water. But your whole history, your ancestry, that's who you are. No, I am who I am now. Before I was no one. When you're everyone in the past and when you're for everyone in the present, you're no one, nobody. You don't exist. I didn't exist. If you prefer a world where I didn't exist, then stop bringing me fish. Fine, said Ori. So I, that's like a, so powerful. That I feel like this is like the thesis yeah. of the whole book. It's like, it's like the grass is always greener kind of thing. It's yeah. like Ori doesn't have any memories and thinks that she would give up anything to have them and Yetu is the only one with all the memories and is like, no, it hurts. Like, it's too much. Yeah. It, it, it's very much like this talking point of where Yetu is the guardian of her people and Ori's all that's left of her people. Right. So it, it's this very interesting dichotomy of where you have one person yearning to know and the other hating to know. Right very interesting yeah and i feel like <laughs> i feel the like cats the cats i feel like the end of the book is like a healthy balance for mm -hmm. both of them so yeah we'll get there yeah so after this ori does not come back for three days she met yeah and then yet she remembers when she was first made a historian she was filled with so much grief she was actively suicidal and then Amba asks, what's wrong? And then Yetu tells her some of the memories. And Amba's like, why would you tell me that? And I'm just like, I don't know. Maybe because your 14-year-old daughter is dealing with this. And you asked her to. And you asked her to? <laughs> like, oh, God. Okay. That part made me so mad. I was like. And then um, uh, Amaba is like, let's have a party. It'll make you feel great. And then Yetu's like, I don't want to fucking party. But okay, whatever. <laughs> and then so she sends Yetu out to hunt for food. And then Yetu takes down a shark all by her little lonesome <laughs> and then performs a ritual for the ancestors to take away the history from her, but it does not work. Yeah. But then Amaba comes with the rest of the people but calling for the historian and not for Yetu. And it just, I, I have a quote I need to read in a second, but it like hammers home like the for the first time that Yetu is not Yetu, she is the historian. Right. Even to her own mother. Right. She does not matter as a person. It's like, no matter who you're around, like, you're going to call your daughter by her name. Like, especially when you're looking for her. Like, that's so bad. And then after, like, a mama realizes she fucked up <laughs> because she could see, like, how, like, this really upset Yetu is. And so she, I got a quote, I will send them away. We will go home, said Amaba, perhaps apologetic for assisting on the gathering that brought so many people near. Amaba did what she could to soothe Yetu, but the problem was not that she could not share, the, the, but the problem was that she could not share in this tragedy. She could not share Yetu's loneliness. All she could do was stroke her tremoring, sobric body. There was no saving Yetu. Okay, okay. I just wrote, man. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, so back to present. When Ori comes back, it is awkward and difficult between them, but their friendship is still there, if not quite. Um, Yetu is still racked by guilt and fear over what she's done. The approaching rough weather had had all the markings of a Wajinri Tempest, the slow, slow brew of it, the uncertain and moving center, the feeling of electricity in the air. Yetu had brought this. Her simple but extraordinary rebellion might drown the world if she didn't stop it. If she could stop it. Yetu wasn't sure she'd still be able to gather the rememberings from them. And the strength of Wajinri were mass too great for her to overcome. She always struggled to face the darkness. And the thought of returning to the Wajinri choked her with dread. The impossible weight of her responsibility for the world would obliterate her before she had the chance to fix what she had done. So it's been three weeks of healing. Yetu misses the ocean and wants to return. Her body was not meant for shallow waters. It was meant for the deep. But she can breathe air. She can breathe air. Also, I feel like we haven't noted that, like, 
The Legendre, because they have this, like, electrical sense, they can literally cause, like, tsunamis and hurricanes and a bunch of bad shit. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. So don't make them mad. Yeah. So Yetu misses her people, and she thinks in a few more days she'll go back home. Uh, Suga and their sister offer medicine to help Yetu heal, and it does. And then <laughs> Yetu is feeling good for a second. <laughs> yeah, and then the storm comes, and it is a long one, but Ori still visits Yetu. Yetu asks where they are, and Ori's like, I don't want you to know because like, you need to go home. Um, and yet you then this is this is this is, this is we got a little awkward here. Then this was a little, little I was I'm on the fence if this was necessary. <laughs> I'm on the fence. Like for world building reasons, it low key is, but also like I totally. Guess, but it is a novella. Do we need this much world building? Like mm. the whole thing is like an analogy as it is. Do we need to know how the Okay, let's get Fish it. people have sex. Okay. Uh, Yetu asks Ori about her body, or more particularly two-legged bodies. Uh, Yetu was confused by primary and secondary sex characteristics. Yes. I have a quote. Ba, 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 ba. Is it a choice, Yetu pressed? While Jinru's bodies didn't tend to have differences along those lines, but like two legs, there were men, women, both, and neither. Such things were self-determined, and Yetu wondered if two leggeds had body self-determination too. We keep yours inside of you. Is that a protective measure, too? Um, so, <laughs> okay, so Wajinro is that a protective measure? Have both male and female sex organs. Right. And it's just like up to you in the moment what you're gonna use. Right. Um, or all of it. All of it. Whatever. <laughs> or you're all of it. Whatever you know we're feeling. And so, um, you basically pick what it means to you. So that's right. why male, female, neither, both. I feel like that it this is necessary because. In the afterward, uh, did you read that? No, I did not. Okay, because this is supposed to be like a utopia. Okay. Like the Wajinru is supposed to be like, you know, we okay. came from enslaved people and then we made this utopia besides, you know, the horrible memory part. But yeah. so I feel like that's what that mm -hmm. is for. Yeah. I, <laughs> I also think it's as well supposed to be rejecting Western ideas of gender and sex because yeah. it is a documented fact that us white people, we did a lot of fucked up things to indigenous groups' understandings of cultural uh, sex understanding. Yeah. So I think it's supposed to bring that in as well because that's why it's like male, female, both, neither. Right. Okay. So, um... And then, like, um, Ori ha has some questions about mating, and Yetu's a big old virgin <laughs> and does not know how it actually works. Um, and then, like, flirting happens between them. I where, don't know. Where, uh, and Yetu's like, yeah, I think you're hot. And then Ori's like, I also think you're hot. And it's like, I was like... <laughs> Did not see interspecies lesbian coming into this. But I love it. I love I'm it. I'm not gonna lie, I'm I love it. <laughs> I love the shape of water, so I can't hate. Right. Yeah, that and was it. the blueprint for this. No, stop. <laughs> stop it. That's what it that's what it yet to say. I was doing um the hand signals from the shape of water where <laughs> <laughs> Octavia Butler's character as the main character, how the fishman's dick comes out. Yeah. She like puts up both hands, like they're cupped together, and then opens one and drops the other one into a penis. <laughs> it slits open and it comes on out. Okay. That's the third time the word slit has slit. been said this episode, slit. and I hate it. Okay. Make it stop. Um, or he isn't quite down with the sickness yet to fuck yeah. around and find out um so ori uh she's actually gonna leave to go back to her homeland to take care of it and check in mm -hmm. and yet too scared um for her to leave and they argue and ori just like you can follow me and but yet too was not ready to leave the tide pool so ori leaves and then suka comes by and she yells at suka what did suka do nothing and yet too is overcome by her fear and grief and what memories she has and then a storm comes. 
And then let me grab the quote. The big storm. The big storm. Okay, storm waters filled the tidal pool, dark and murky, blotting out Yetu's view, teeming life inside. The future too was dark, if there was a future at all. The hurt that coursed through Yetu as she imagined a futureless world rivaled the pain of the rememberings. Could it really be that they were the version of the world where everything would be eradicated, gone? She imagined how it felt when the history left her, the freedom of it. But freedom only brought loneliness, emptiness. What was the point? Nothingness was a fate worse than pain. How long would it take for yet to become ravenous for something to fill the hole the way the other Yajinru did? She doubted she could last even a year. She was already aching to see Ori. But also, Haramaba. At least with pain, there was life, a chance at change and redemption. The rememberings might still kill her, but the Wajinru would go on, and so too would the rest of the world. The turbulent oys were a chaos of her own making, and it was time to face them. So, now we switch perspectives. Uh, Basha, my man. We are now Basha. Um, and, well, first, before we're Basha, we are a different historian, first, for a hot second. Yeah. It, it, it's showing the way that it works through the historians and the rememberings. Is that um, one of the historians thought Zodi was a fucking liar. And was like, you know what? I don't even think she met a human named Raj. I'm going to go to the surface and see what's up. And then she gets kidnapped by a bunch of sailors who pull her up on a hook. And then she has to kill them all and then jump back down in the water. Oh, did you delete that information? <laughs> I think I deleted that from my brain. And then we turned into Basha, our okay. angry, war-hungry man. <laughs> this, this was just like, so when I was listening to this, mm -hmm. The first, like, historian account, I thought it really was, like, I thought Zoti Aleyu was, like, multiple people. Mm -hmm. And so then when it went to Basha, I knew it was just one person, but he was still saying we. You, but, you were shouting. Oh, sorry. I'm getting really <laughs> worked up. But I thought he, Basha was going to be, like, a, a, a multiple personalities. No. So stupid. Okay. So follow the follow the line. Um, so we see how the other historians lived and the ways each one struggled, uh, and the way that Yetu is in their own ways. The historian after Aj thinks that Zoti was a liar, um, <laughs> and tries to disprove Zoti's truth by going to the surface, which I just explained all that. Yeah. And also now all of them in the remembrance, every single time they find out what Zoti did to all of them, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. Um, uh, now Basha's living his life as the current historian. Basha hates the current leader, Amju. Amju wants to talk about the bombs that are being dropped in the ocean. And there's dead children. Basha does not want to talk about this. Uh, and Basha's very different than Yetu as a historian. I got the quote quote. Basha, like, owns this shit. I feel like he <laughs> was certainly born to be the historian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, wait, that was the wrong one. Okay. Um, clueless Wajimru gossip as they wander the waters. They would know the answer to this question. They live beyond the bubbles of the Wajimru cities. They listen to the things we had to say more than just what, when it was convenient. We cannot understand a people that would willingly choose to cut itself off from its history no matter what pain it tails. Pain is energy. It lights us. This is the most basic premise of our life. Hunger makes us eat. Tiredness causes us to sleep. Pain makes us avenge. We are not Wajinru if being a Wajinru means distracting ourselves from pain. We embrace pain, seek it out. We make a path through the water. People splitting their parties to accommodate us. They fear us. The reaction doesn't bother us. We aren't to be trifled with. It is a good that they recognize this. I don't know if the camera picked that up. A little marshmallow popping your head <laughs> up. <laughs> Doing evil things because he wants mommy to go bed. Okay. So. Um, very different than yet too. Yeah. Different approaches. Yeah. <laughs> um, guess what though? Basha has a lover, a secret lover named Ephris. Uh, Ephris does the historian have to be gay? No, but um, it does say that it's actually, they're not supposed to have lovers. That's why it's a secret lover. Oh. They're supposed to be pure. Oh yeah, I forgot that part. I forgot. Okay, so Everest tells Basha to consider a discussion. Like, he meets up with, with Everest, and then they, like, fuck a bunch. And then they have this discussion. Yeah. 
Um, Ephraim tells Basha to consider a discussion with Maju about the bombs and like saving the children. And Basha knows how to save them, which is to spread out. It, like, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. But Basha doesn't think Amaju will listen. But Ephraim convinces Basha. Guess what, everyone? Amaju doesn't listen, <laughs> but others do. And then soon they all gather. Amaju's been mad about this gathering. And then Basha gives major warnings that humans are cruel and terrible beings. He also mentions the oil rigs at this point. So this is definitely... Oh. So this is where, when I said this is like World Wars time. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, because he said they're they're digging, digging down. Then, what is he building in there? <laughs> what is that? That's a TikTok audio. Okay. What is he building in there? What is Marshmallow digging at? <laughs> uh, hello? Marshy Warshy. Okay, so, um, Basha wants a war- you don't need it anymore, you have to drive an hour home, put it away. It's just Miller Lite, it's basically water. Don't drive drunk. I'm not Marshy Mellow. He's in the furnace room. Okay, note this time, we gotta mm -hmm. cut this out. 56 minutes. Around okay. I'm not cutting that out. I thought I was editing the audio now. No, I'm not editing the audio. How am I supposed to match it up? I was gonna send the audio file to you. Okay. Before I put it. So who are we, so how are we supposed to decide what you put in and what I take out? I, I cut nothing out of the podcast ever. Okay, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyways, moving on. Um. So Basha wants a war with the humans. Yeah. He wants to kill them all. Uh, and Basha is full of anger and pain against humans in a ways that Yetu is not. And Basha, like, angrily swims away from everybody, um, just full of little anger. And then the city's bombed. Um, Ephraim lives, so that's a plus. Um, a plus. Amaji wants to spread the people thin to save them. Basha wants to fight. Basha then basically, like, leads a coup. And then, like, a war is waged. I don't know what was the, this was about. Yeah, I don't know what ends up happening. Like, do they go and fight the humans? I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I don't know what, like, historical event is being tied here. I don't know. Okay. Anyways, back to Yetu. Uh, the storm wages and her tide pool fills, but she is still frozen by indecision. Um, getting the next quote. Okay. No easy solution presented itself to her. No scenario where Yetu maintained her peace and freedom and the world survived. Maybe the sacrifice of a single person was the only path toward. It would result in the fewest amount of deaths. Yetu knew how to contain the rememberings. If she took them back, the uproar in the water causing the storm would calm, saving two leg lives, including Suka, their people, and Ori. It would save the Wajinru from their grief. Yetu hoped they hadn't already starved themselves. So... As her tide wool fills with fresh ocean water, her connection to the ocean reignites and yet she summons the water to her so she can be free and get over the, the rocks holding her in. And then she gives herself to the ocean and she is free. She returns to the deep. She races back to other people. They have destroyed the room and are like all like, like mosh pitting basically. They're like, what the fuck's going on? And they have caused these turbulent waters. Uh, the remembrance still haunts them all, unable to move, thin, malnourished. I have a quote. Yet to swim closer, it wouldn't work to shout. God, I'm so sorry. The cat. He's being insane. He's an insane person. Oh my God. You're telling me you're not going to cut this out. We're, we're going to have to. <laughs> Scratching and banging. I'm so sorry. It's not, good. It's not entertainment. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give you the raw audio file so okay. you can see it, but then I, I will do the, the audio stuff. Okay. okay. Anyways, um, it, it, Yetu swam closer and wouldn't work to shout. Shouting never woken Yetu from being lost in the history. Instead, she channeled her energy into connecting with them the same way she would have done traditionally at the end of a remembrance before taking the history back. She touched each one of them, figuring out who each Wajinru was outside of the oneness the remembrance brought. That mattered. Who each of them was mattered as much as who all of them were together. For so long, the Wajinru hadn't felt like living creatures to yet too. Just a mass that fed off her remembrance for her own for their own benefit. But like yet too, they were their own people too. 
They had not asked for the emptiness any more than Yatu had asked for the history. Amaba had said it herself before the remembrance. They were cavities. Ori had felt that that way too, robbed of her people's past. It wouldn't be that, it shouldn't be that way. And it wouldn't have to. Okay, so Yatu begins to take all the memories back. Then Amaba like comes rearing up calling for her and tries to stop by the Yatu. Because Amaba now understands the pain of the memories and asks Yatu to share the pain with them. Um, Join us, said Amaba, begging. I would sooner die than let you suffer this alone. You begged me to understand and I never did. I never could. Now I know, my child, I know. And I will not see you bear it without your Amaba, without your kindred. And maybe she didn't have to. Maybe instead of taking the history from them, she could join them as they experienced it, just like they were the remembrance. She could guide them through the rememberings so it didn't overtake them with such violence. They could bear it all together. Usually after the remembrance, the historian waited nearby, empty of the memories. But what would happen if they stayed? What would happen if someone with experience stayed with the Wajiru past the moment of completion? Could she wrangle them back toward consciousness without taking the memories back? Could she live out their days while sharing the memories together? Zotileilu wanted the Wajiru to be one together, but they never were. They were two. The historian and her subjects. It was time for the two to be merged. Yes! Fine. Why was it not like this the whole time? Like, why did the second historian be like, this is... Sorry, <laughs> I'm screaming. Why is it... Why would they do this? Like, why would the understand. second historian be like, this is not... I, I Okay. I think... Well, first of all, the second story was Aj. So, Aj is up to some shit. Okay, I meant the one after him. I think it's supposed to be... Um, well, they sang the songs. They wanted they wanted to protect them from it. And right. Basha wanted to use that pain to ignite them into war. Right. And Yetu is now saying, no, we need to share this pain because it is pain. We cannot use it in any kind of way. It's not beauty. It's pain. It must be lived as pain. Right. And... <laughs> and we can live it all together instead of just one person sacrificing themselves for as long as they can take it mm -hmm. to you know yeah so i wrote wrote a cry right now jesus did you see my eyes watering as i read those quotes mm -hmm. i'm a big crier i cry so much when i read sad <laughs> things aloud okay so um uh Okay, and so Yetu shares the pain with her people in the ocean, as the ocean was the first Amaba. Oh. It takes three days for all their pain to settle down. Her Amaba are closer now than ever before, and Yetu wants to find Ori. Amaba remembers the song that Wa sang to Zotia Leu, and they all thought their mother sang it to them, but no, it was Wa singing it to Zotia Leu. And, uh... Yetu knows where Ori is now because of that song. Because it's the same language. Oh, gotcha. Waj was from Ori's people. And the, I thought it was the comb. Hmm. Because the comb has the same markings as Ori has tattooed on her face. Mm -hmm. Anyways, let me, let me, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm about to read it to you. <clears throat> I know where she is, Yetu said, and left her Amaba at once to try to find Ori. Waj, the first surface dweller a Wajinru had befriended, had lived on an island called Tosha. It was the Wajinru word for belonging. It was also the Tosha word for belonging. Waji had told Zoti, the first historian, where she was from and where she was heady. Zoti had misinterpreted her. Perhaps Waj had deliberately played with her. It was a small island in the backward C-shaped cradle of the African continent, and it took Yetu a day to swim there. She didn't know if Ori would even still be there. It, would, it had been a while now since the storm had passed. Yetu swam close to the shore, careful not to touch the beast herself. Ori, she screamed, her voice ugly and strange. And of course, Ori, she called her nonstop for hours, her voice as loud as she could imagine. Finally, she gave up, accepting reality. If Ori was here, she was not coming. 
-hmm. Oh, yeah. So this is what Haley's talking about. Ori had markings on her face, these beautiful and terrific tattoos. Some of the symbols were identical to etchings on the comb I received shortly before the last remembrance. One of the offerings made of me. I assume they were bite marks, but of course they are not. They are intentional carvings. I misinterpreted. My Ori comes from the place where this object is from. Does this spark anything from you? A location. Okay, so that's when. That's when she sings the song. song. And then it sparks the memory of Wash. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, Yetu waits for days, but Ori does not come. After a week of grieving, thinking Ori probably died in the storm, she finally sees a boat. It's Ori's boat. And Ori sees her in the water, and Ori jumps off the boat into the water. They hold each other, and Ori cries, and so does Yetu. And Yetu offers Ori a life in the sea. And so Yetu kind of transforms her, not into a full Wajinru, but she can breathe underwater. Yeah. Are you gonna read the quote? Because I don't understand how this happened. Um, okay, I, I guess I can go back that far. They held each other close until Yetu was able to transfer to Ori the remembering of the womb. Lost in it, Ori stopped treading uh, and she sank a little. Yetu let her sink, holding her tightly so she could quickly return her to the surface if need be. But when Ori jolted from the remembering, she was breathing underwater, just as she breathed in the womb. She did not transform in the way Roger and Pups transformed in the two legs belly. She didn't grow gills or fins, but like Yetu, she could breathe both on land and sea. She was a completely new thing. Uh, Yetu beckoned her downward into the dark, into the world of beauty. For most of her life, Yetu had yet to shut it out, split between the past and the present, her mind unable to manage even the dullest input, but the world was infinite and magnificent, and she had finally found her place in it. Come, said Yetu. Ori followed, this time the two legs venturing into the depths that had not been abandoned to the sea, but invited into it. Yeah, such a good ending. I feel like that was important world building for like how the Wajin Room become Wajin Room. Okay, so the way that the transformation worked is it is the way babies learn how to swim. You know how like right. a baby can swim in the water? Yeah, it's fucking crazy. But, but like the Wajin Room are born from water into water so mm -hmm. they that's when they become what they are and so when yet to yeah but the ocean also grants wishes i don't that wasn't that's that was, in the text that but she was joking no she was not she was serious no she wasn't she was serious the ocean grants wishes no. Yes. The power of the ocean. No, it was the, the memory of the womb. And that. But it's also the ocean power. Okay. It can be the ocean power or whatever. Oh, God. Anyways. So, it, it, it was basically just because, like, also when babies are in the womb, they breathe in. Um, they practice breathing in the womb with amniotic fluid. So, that's what that was doing. Oh. That's why sometimes babies have bowel movements because they swallow the amniotic yeah. fluid. All right, so let's talk about love. So, Ori and Yetu, thoughts? So I, again, listened to the audiobook. So David Biggs did the voice for Ori, obviously, because he did the whole audiobook. And Ori's voice was so deep. That's right, that's really all I have to say, is that she was, she seemed so harsh. And then when she was, when she was sweet to Yetu, it made it all better. Basha and Ephraim, thoughts? I love them. Ephraim is just like a sweet little baby, and then Basha's like a hard ass, and they just yeah. balance each other out. Yeah. All right. Theme park. Generational trauma on the sharing of pain. Yes. Yes. Precisely. So uh, this is twofold. So there's actually a genetic theory that actual physical trauma that occurs in your ancestral line affects you to this day that makes sense so like an example of one that i read was someone's grandfather was in a train accident when he was a teenager and he survived it but everyone in their family after that is terrified of riding on trains and they didn't know about this train accident until their grandfather died when they were going through like records that he had so like that's a trauma that exists or like for example those of us who have a like parents who like great parents great grandparents 
who did not do well during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. You can now see that as a direct lineage of now people having issues with metabolism because you have generational mm. markers that are saying um, you need to hold on to all this weight because you're going to go through another famine. It's the same way. Now in Ireland, you see that as well, is there's a lot more big bodied people because of the potato famine. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense because like, I don't know, I haven't read the book, but there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's mm -hmm. just talking about like how you, you keep trauma in your body and like your brain changes mm -hmm. and like your body changes and like your responses to stimuli is different. And that it would make sense that you would like pass that on yeah you know? and then also as well this is obviously dealing with the generational trauma of slavery which african americans yeah. in the united states still will deal with to this day um because for a lot of people it, it's not like some distant ancestor it's your great grandparents it's your right it's people that you're the like, people in your life who live this way um and so and then also the fact that a lot of people, pretty much everyone who's African-American descended from slavery has to deal with the fact that the people who enslaved their families, their descendants are also walking upon them. And so it's kind of playing with those ideas of like two leggers did this, but some of them right. can be good, even though she knows what they can do. Right. And so it, it it's really like, bringing the metaphor full, fully forward of like instead of interracial problems it's interspecial problems yeah i th i just i feel like that's such a small i feel like that was a smaller part of it though i feel like the bigger aspect is just like uh, we should read the those discussion questions that were on that thing okay. we'll get them that to my loving author okay but that's that's my theme park generational trauma and the sharing of pain yeah i feel like it's like the it's like you have with our two characters, Ori and Yetu, it's like two opposite sides of sharing pain. It's like mm -hmm. Ori doesn't have anyone to share it with and she's like completely cut off from her history and Yetu doesn't have anyone to share it with, but she has all of the history. So she has mm -hmm. the pain of having the history with nowhere to go with it and Ori is the same way mm -hmm. with no history, the pain of not having the history. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Representation station. Um, I don't really like this whole book. This whole like, this whole book. I, I whole just book. I feel like the whole thing like, is just an you, analogy. You look uh, race discussions, uh, sexuality discussions, body discussions, uh, class discussions, even as well. Because yeah, a little with Basha and Anju. Yeah, so there's that. Does it hold up? It's a new book. It's great. Like, I think it's amazing. It's a very good book. Um, Night of the Living Author. Okay, this is where we're gonna talk. Yes. Also, I wanted to talk about the, before we get into that, I wanted to talk about the afterword a little. Go for it. Um, because I just, I feel like this was, okay. So Drexia, I feel like we need to talk about a, a little more about the history of where mm -hmm. this started. So Drexia was a band, started this techno electro mm -hmm. like they had these multiple albums and um then aquanauts oh never mind aquanauts that's a kids tv show what aquanauts is a kids tv show okay let me just read this could it be possible for humans to breathe underwater a fetus in its mother's womb is certainly alive in an aquatic environment during the greatest Holocaust the world has ever known, pregnant African bound, no, American, America bound African slaves were thrown overboard by the thousands during labor for being sick in disruptive cargo. I don't, you know, you're right. An aquanaut is a person who remains underwater, breathing at the ambient pressure for long enough. Okay. Anyway. Is it possible that they could have given birth at sea to babies that never needed air? Are Drexians water breathing aqu aquatically mutated descendants of those unfortunate victims of human greed? Mm -hmm. Have they been spared by God to teach us or terrorize us? So I feel like I've I just I don't know if there's there's certainly aspects of the 
you know, the actual slave part of it, but I feel like more it's like, what if they didn't have that specific trauma? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, there, there's, it's, 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 what, to me, I'm interpreting it more, less of that and more of a, let's talk about those women who were killed and, and give new life to them when their lives were taken from them. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's where I was taking it. So I want to read just, just some uh, samplings from The Deep by Clipping. Um, Clipping, it, uh, was, ex was inspired by Drexia's Ovir and commissioned and was commissioned by This American Life, which is a podcast I want to listen to someday, um, on Afrofuturism in 2017. The track appeared on Clipping's album Splendor and Misery in 2018, a science fiction concept album that was nominated for a Hugo Award. Um, so, okay, so some lyrics. I'm just gonna read some. Our mothers were pregnant African women thrown overboard while crossing the Atlantic Ocean on slave ships. We are born breathing water as we did in the womb. We built our home on the seafloor, unaware of the two-legged surface dwellers. Until the world came to destroy ours with cannons, they searched for oil beneath our cities. Their greed and recklessness forced our uprising. Tonight, we remember. Y'all remember how deep it go. Started from the bottom. Y'all remember how deep it go. And then, it, th this base, you can definitely see where a lot of, like, one-for-one -one moments from this song to the book occur. Oh, yeah. So, go listen to the song. And why won't we more? Because uh, we're pushing fair use claims as it is with what we do here. Okay. It's certainly transformative. Yeah, so transformative. <laughs> so the history portion. So Yetsu and the Wajunu were born from the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so there's actually a website called Slave Voyages, um, and it's a digital memorial to the 10 to 12 million Africans who were forced to endure the transatlantic journey into humanizing conditions and so you can actually go online to slave forages and actually see the actual mapping of where they were brought from africa where they stopped along the way and were brought to the united states um and then discussion questions like this um we're looking at like a document that for little public library put together we'll put it in the description if i remember um and it talks about the power of pronouns. Yeah, here. Let me read in Clipping's words here, mm -hmm. what they say. Um, the first rule we established shortly after Clipping formed was that David's lyrics should never be written from the first-person perspective. This extended to the banishment of all first-person pronouns and possesses, I, me, my, etc. For the deep, we continued to follow this rule, but narrowed it even further. The only pronoun allowed in the song was y'all. Our prohibition of the first person was, in part, a reaction to the fiercely individualistic authorship presumed in the rap lyrics. So, in imagining that Drexian utopia might look like through the lens of Clipping's mm -hmm. linguistic rules, we imagine their culture might affirm the collectivity mm -hmm. over the individual and therefore the plural over the singular. Mm -hmm. Which I just, that's just such a cool, like, yeah. the they are all one people mm -hmm. and they share this one mm -hmm. memory and so mm -hmm. right yeah yeah that's, I that's so interesting okay so discussing questions so these are discussion questions created by saga press itself so not this library the one that i specifically want to talk about is number four which is the first historian zofi had pure intentions when they began the remembering cycle I fear if they know the truth of everything, they will not be able to carry on or they'll swim to the surface to learn things for themselves. I do not want them to learn, page 63. How justified is it for Zoti to make this decision for the whole species? Does it help or hinder the growth of their community? So I kind of just want to talk more about like, it was she justified in doing that? I, I, you can't, one person can't make that decision for a whole group of people, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, it, it's definitely, you understand where she's coming from, but at the same right. time. It's like, you want to save people from that, but also that is like what Ori said. It's like, your history is who you are, mm -hmm. you know? And so I feel like, and at the end, everyone does have it again, because mm -hmm. that is who you are, and you deserve mm -hmm. to know that, I think. Yeah. And we, you, I want to I wanna pick how I say this very carefully. It's, to my understanding, 
as a white person we're both white it's it's also kind of also reminiscent of when Africans were enslaved how they didn't know their histories like they knew it was passed down word to mouth but it wasn't word to mouth mouth to ear like passed down between each other and it's not until slavery was abolished and ended that the whole truth came out kind of you know where I'm going with this of where like they knew it was bad but not how bad it was and how across the board it was right i kind of see a parallel being drawn there i might just be drawing that myself as a reader and my knowledge and understanding yeah i mean in but in that situation zotis kind of like the white person that doesn't let yeah news travel so or um, even like if you want to take the staple of the fact that like you don't know all of your family's stories. You might know that something bad happened at one point, but it could be that your parent decides we're not talking about this ever again. Right. And it's not for a very long time that you find out from someone else what exactly happened. And suddenly so many more things make sense. Right. Of, oh, that makes a lot more sense about what's going on here. So, but I also feel like with Zoti keeping those memories and only passing them to one person and you know giving them it's like they it's like when you talk about a history every single day and it's commonplace it's mm -hmm. like you like at the end what I assume they will do is like learn to live with it learn how to be have it be a part of them but not be their whole thing mm -hmm. but before it was like they don't have any idea of who they are they just you know live year to year mm -hmm. instead of like becoming their own thing and also as well they're starving for this information that's so overwhelming to them because right. they never allow themselves to process it right it's only the info dump and then immediately removal there's no right. processing chance and when yetu leaves they have a chance to process it. Right. And it's still horrible. It's too much for a single person to ever take on. Right. But, yeah. I got lots of good things. All right. Let's get into rate that book. It's a 10. It's a 10 for me. How believable was the magic? It was very good. Haley, it seems like you've had some qualms with the ocean magic. I don't think it's ocean magic. It's, I think it's, I think it's the... It's the being in the womb, and it's the remembering of the womb. We're pro mermaids on this on this corner of the podcast. Of course, you're pro. Of course, I'm pro mermaid. Why, why did you take anti pro mermaid, mermaid from that? <laughs> okay, will we let our middle school selves read this book? Yes and no. Like I feel like when I was in middle school, I did not have like the cognitive like capabilities to fully understand what's going on. Probably more as like a high school student, I would be able to read it and understand what's going on. I would have absolutely, I would think, it, I would literally just take it literally and be like, oh, it's mermaids in yeah. middle school because I was stupid. Yeah, it, it's about cognitive ability, but all right. Yeah. That wraps up The Deep by River Sullivan. Love it. I also love that River's name is Rivers. Love that, plural. Rivers. What's their pronouns? Yeah. They don't, I believe. Oh, it'd be, oh, I saw it. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, here's, here's the questions. Oh, more yeah. questions. Tons of questions. questions. Oh, I also thought it was really interesting how in the afterward, I keep saying it's just Davi because he was the one that read it, but it was Olive Clipping that wrote the afterword, I suppose. But they say, like, what is technically canon for the deep? And they said that, like, everything is technically canon because, you know, everyone has, like, their own mm -hmm. story and, like, brings their own experience mm -hmm. to something. And I think that that's such an interesting perspective mm -hmm. of, like... There is no specific canon and like the way mm -hmm. things work because, you know, we don't all experience things the same way. Mm -hmm. So I think you want to retract a statement you made earlier in the podcast. What? 
So uh, Solomon is non-binary and intersex. So I think that is what the importance of making all of the um, the people intersex. So what did I say? You thought it was we didn't need to know all that. No, I it wasn't. It was a negative. It, it was a negative, but but I took it back. I said it was important. Okay. And then they use faith fair and they then pronouns. Okay. So that's what they're up to. Okay. So uh, that concludes the deep. And then next week we are reading Wrecking Requiem of Silence, Silence by L. Penelope. I've read not a single novella. So I'm just dropping back in. I don't know. I haven't read any of the novellas either. Yeah. Fake fans Whoa. over here. Um, you also, don't you own the novellas? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, catch us back next time. Hopefully we'll have our mic situation figured out. And it also hopefully won't be freezing cold in my basement next time. <laughs> I'm fine. You, Haley's wearing a sweatshirt. I'm wearing a thin little blouse. I feel like we didn't wrap the book up well enough. I feel like we wrapped it up for now. Like it, the, I feel like we left it where it left itself. Of where the it, the book doesn't end in a perfect little bow. No, I guess everyone's happy at the end. That's good. So there, I there I mean, all... like suffering, but suffering together and working through um, it together. So it, it's really just more about like, how do I want to say this? It. it it leaves you wanting. It leaves you thinking. It yeah, I wish you... it was a whole series. Yeah. More, please. I also listen to the music. Mm -hmm. Some of it. I listen to the clipping song, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the deep, the albums by Drexia, mm -hmm. very interesting. Hmm. I don't really get into, like, electro techno music at all, but, like... Mm -hmm. I was making these little letters up here last night while I was listening to it mm -hmm. and just bopping along. Yeah. Anyway, that still didn't really wrap up, but I that's the deep. It was good. We liked it. We did really like it. It I think this is probably one of the more difficult books that we've actually like It is stuck. adult. It's an adult speculative fiction novel. Yeah. Um it's very good. Do you recommend? Yes. You sat through it. Um uh yeah so uh catch us back later in the month besties yes um uh, we're I'm visiting gonna... re we're visiting el penelope again and i'm so excited to finally finish that series um i'm gonna go turn the furnace back on okay. i'm gonna drive home i don't know <laughs> and this is gonna be kind of a boring bit because i'm always just gonna be driving home after it i don't know we could be going to dinner afterwards that's true we don't always have to record at 10 p.m. PM. on a Thursday. Things happen. I, I'm fine. not mentally well. Anyways, uh, uh, we majored in English for this. And this one I can't believe mm -hmm. that we majored in English to discuss this. So. Alrighty. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>